Hello, welcome to the Pillow Talk podcast. I'm Will Beck. I'm your host. And with me today is Teddy Riley. Teddy is a singer, songwriter, a pioneer of New Jack Swing, and the creator of one of my favorite songs of all time, No Diggity. Uh, wow. Teddy, thanks for uh, joining the show. Thank you for having me. It's been a while <laughs> since we had dinner. <laughs> yeah, man, that was, uh, let's see, I think in January. It was a great yes, dinner, though. Uh, yeah, it was. So how do you uh, how you sleep last night? I actually slept well, especially with my pillow. So yeah. I'm, I'm in Africa and, you know, I brought my pillows with me and I brought my uh, my uh, cover, the the sheets and the really you the whole bag set. Yeah, I had to have it out here. I have it at home. So I got I got to have it here. I got to be the same like I'm at home. Yeah, that's great. So um, what part of Africa are you in? I'm in Cape Verde. Okay. And that's like a little island, right? That's one of the 10 islands off the, what's it, Portugal. And then you have uh, Morocco and all of uh-huh. the places around. But yeah, it's one of the islands of Cape Verde. What made you uh, want to go to Cape Verde? Well, to do some music and learn the culture and you know, um, that's pretty much it. Music, really. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And then I fell in love with it. I've been back and forth here since uh, July of last year. Okie doke. So is that going to be like a permanent residence for you? Or are you going to be there every year for months at a time? Or Yeah, it'll be back and forth. You know, of course, I love Vegas. And that's my home. But uh, I'm out here for the... The reason of uh, working with um, African and world artists. Sorry, you kind of cut out there on that last answer. What was that? You're working with what? Yeah, working with um, Afrobeats artists. Okay. And also um, just learning the culture. You know, I love it out here. I actually like it out here more than living there. Really? So what because is... Um... Because I've not been to Africa. I don't know what it's like at all. Like, what's different about Africa there? I mean, you know, what's it like? It is... How could I say? It's what you make it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to party, you can party. If you want to work, you can work. If you want peace, you can have peace. And uh, the other islands are not too far. So you can actually go to the other islands and, you know, uh, enjoy yourself, come back. You know, the boats will take you there, the ship. Mm -hmm. And um, that's pretty much what it is, you know. So when I want to have fun, I can. But most times I'm working. You know, I just spent about my last 17 days uh, doing music for New Edition. Mm-hmm. So, um, cause they're, they're entering into their 40th anniversary. Of oh, wow. Yeah. So that's what I've been working on and it's been some sleepless nights, but, uh, it's not good for you. Yeah, it isn't. It isn't. But you know, <laughs> when you're working hard and you have your mind set on something, you, uh, you just go for it, you know, and sleep or eating, you know, you kind of forget about it because your mind is set on that goal. So, but do you, do you get in that kind of zone a lot where you're just like not thinking about eating or sleeping, but you're just like so focused on the music? Is that pretty common? Yes, it is. I mean, pretty much all my life I've been that way. You know, that's the reason why I've got to have someone around me to remind me to eat <laughs> and just to remind me to stop, you know, for a little while and get some rest. Mm-hmm. Is that when you do your best work, when you kind of get into that like zone, that focus? Yes, exactly. Um, and it's mostly at night. So, mm-hmm. and, and that's like everybody's sleeping time. So I kind of dress this room up, which is my hotel room. I dress this room up so it can be night in the daytime. <laughs> okay. So... I can get, you know, a comfortable sleep, you know, because the mind always think, you know, first mind takes you into if it's daytime, I can't sleep. Mm -hmm. 
So, but if it's night time, you know, and it's dark in here, I can go to sleep. So, um, are you in a hotel the whole time you're there? Yes, I've been in a hotel um, pretty much since last year. Mm -hmm. And is it a normal sized hotel room? Do you like that lifestyle? I it's it looks like it feels like a whole apartment because it's not the typical size. It's yeah. like twice, it's say two, two rooms mm -hmm. in one. So bathtub, everything is right there. It's kind of blurry; you can't see it. So, um, but yeah, I kind of enjoy it because I made it my own. You know, yeah. Put cabinets in here and storage because I have my equipment. And some of the stuff is like hard drive. So I kind of keep it away, you know, and food. I don't want food out. So I kind of keep it, you know, neat. And uh, and it's only, you know, because it's my conscience. I can't work in a mess. Mm -hmm. It's like I can't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the thing. You know, I, I, um, I'm very particular about sleep. And work. Mm -hmm. It's got to be so, clean. So, uh, what other things other than cleanliness are like really important to your sleep? What's important? Yeah, like it, what are what are your like habits? Like what what things do you do to get ready to sleep? Oh wow, you really want to know that? <laughs> I do. I want to get into it. <laughs> no, um, I have to have some sort of exercise to make me tired. Mm -hmm. It could be a routine in the bed, you know, so I can actually do, you know, sit up. So whatever that will get me tired, because um, I don't like to take any type of chemicals or anything mm -hmm. to, to make me tired. And that's just tea. So if I have, you know, a ginger peppermint tea, I can go to sleep. But I still have to do something like movement to mm -hmm. really get myself tired. And, out. I used to use TV, but TV is truly not good for you because of the radiation, the sine wave that's going, you know, could actually tamper with your hearing. Mm -hmm. So I kind of just, I turn everything off. So do you I mean, watch any TV or are you a no TV guy? No, I do. I do watch, you know, films. Um, and things that, you know, I view sometimes I get, you know, I have a lot of friends who does movies and they'll send it to me and I'll watch them on my free time. I like to read, but I do that at night. That's another routine that I use to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. so I'll read or I'll let, you know, I'll do the audio audible. What's and, your, uh, uh, what's your favorite book? Well, my number one favorite book is. Who Moved My Cheese. Okay. <laughs> have you ever heard of that book? I have heard that book. Yeah. yeah. That's my number one favorite book because it describes my life. I, I move a lot. Uh-huh. If you read that book, you know, Who Moved My Cheese. Um, I'm the mouse. You moved the cheese, I, right? I moved the cheese. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's one of my favorites. Um, the Prayers of Jabez. I haven't heard of that that's one. Another one. Um, you heard? You never heard of I it? I haven't heard of it. What's it called again? That's a scripture in the book. It's a. Uh, I think it's a. Uh, oh, First Chronicles, verse ten. Oh, in the Bible. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the Prayers of Jabez. Oh, okay. that you could bless me indeed, enlarge my territory, that your hands would be with me. And that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. It's part of my prayer, too. Yeah. Yeah. Is a prayer a big part of your kind of sleep routine as well? Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, prayer is a, a big part of mine, too. It's just going through the day and acknowledging my mistakes and, you yeah. know, trying to do better. And also, like, the gratitude portion of prayer. And I think that's actually my favorite part of prayer It's just, like, having an appreciation for the great things that happen to me throughout the day and just recognizing. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this is, uh, it's definitely a part of my piece. Um, you know, usually when I'm the course of my day, 
I always mention God, even if I just say, oh, God, I do this mm-hmm. every day, all day. And people, you know, would notice it. It's like, you know, you're a prayer. <laughs> I said, <laughs> yeah, I am, you know. It's like every time you say, oh, God, or you say, thank you, or you say, I apologize, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And that's even when I'm doing music. If I'm by myself, I even apologize. It's almost like I'm talking to God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know somebody who's like, hey, I only pray once a day. And like, I just start in the morning and I keep going throughout the day and end it at night. You know, <laughs> like a constant. Yeah. But at some point, you know, it's, it's really not always about praying. It's always about talking to him, mm-hmm. about talking to your God, you know, because I guess, you know, everybody's have their own, you know, mm-hmm. Lord to pray to and most high to pray to. So I always say the most high. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what temperature do you like to sleep at or have your room at when you're sleeping? I like it cold. Like what's cold to you? Um, the Celsius is, uh, what is this? It's like 18, 17 sometimes. <laughs> I don't know how to do the, well, let's see, I could, I could do the calculation. I got to multiply that by like nine fifths plus 32. Is that how you do it, Teddy? Do you know? I think so. Yeah. But it's around say 68, 67, I think. Yeah. 64 and a point four. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I just wanted to show off my math skills yeah, for your podcast math. listeners here. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's actually 65 is like the recommended temperature for sleeping, but that helps you to, you know, avoid waking up, doing up, getting hot. Um, what's the first thing you do after you wake up? First thing I do, because I sleep with no phones on, mm-hmm. no phone, no nothing because of the radiation. Um, so the first thing I do is just get up and I'll drink my water. I always mm-hmm. have water on the side of me. Shout That's also out. a good recommendation. Nice cold cup glass of water. Yeah. Yeah, it's not cold. It could be uh-huh. room temperature because I have it on the side pretty much through the night. And then when I wake up, it's room temperature. If you make it cold, that shocks the organs. Uh-huh. So my thing is not to shock the organs, just kind of wake it up with some water because it needs water. It's like water. It's a little gentle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I... uh First thing I do every morning is probably go to the bathroom. <laughs> well, that's what that wakes me up. <laughs> most times I'm using the bathroom before going to sleep. And when I wake up, I don't have to go right away. I just kind of sit up yeah. drink my water, and just kind of look, <laughs> look at nothing, you know, the room. And mm-hmm. then just to wake up my myself, my spirit, you know, so I kind of with my flesh my visual i visualize what my day is going to be like so that's my look when i'm looking it's like okay what am i doing today and then i'll call my assistant and say what's on my plate and then she'll say this 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 or he'll say this 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 and then i'll I'll prepare myself for it yeah i love the idea of visualizing your day beforehand i need to do a better job of that but there's like your mind can just prepare for the day, even kind of like subconsciously, you know, when you're aware of and thinking about what you're doing. And I think you're just going to have a lot more success that way. Uh, you know, there's like a, in the Bible too, everything was created spiritually before it was created mm-hmm. physically, you know? And I, I think in our minds and in our day, we can kind of like, you know, mentally create things before we physically create them, you know, and do what we need to do, which is kind of a interesting idea, but I think you're onto it. Um, so when did you first start getting into music? Oh, I've never done anything else. So, so uh, like when you were like, does that mean you were doing music stuff when you were like three or four? Or? Yeah, I started actually playing my first instrument at three. But what was that first instrument? That was um, my father bought me a trumpet and that was trumpet first. And then kind of got bored of it. and started looking funny going to school, you know, to be able to see like this thing. <laughs> <laughs> a little trumpet on the yeah. lips. Yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with your lips? <laughs> so 
I didn't like that, you know. I felt embarrassed. So uh, I got away from trumpet and I went to guitar. Uh-huh. Father bought me a guitar. And then um, in guitar, I just wanted to explore other instruments. So he bought uh, a keyboard and it was a Telestar. That was the brand. And then... Um, how, how old were you when you got the Telestar? Uh, I think seven. Okay. Six. I was six. But I used to always go to my neighbors and play their organ. You know, the organ. Or I used to, uh, when I went to church back then, I used to try to sneak up to the organ or the piano and just play. And um, to one day, my mom at nine years old, she knew I was doing some stuff on the piano at home. So she said to go up there and play. At nine years old, she said, yeah. play the piano player's not here today. I said, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> she said, uh, well, if you don't do it, when you get home, you're going to be on punishment. And I said, well, I don't want punishment. So <laughs> I went up there and played the, the, the piano and I played what they were singing and they enjoyed it. And then I just said, you know what? I've kind of disciplined myself. I disciplined myself by going home to practice mm-hmm. every day so that I can get better to play the songs that the congregation is singing, like the organists mm-hmm. and the pianists. So when I did that, I became the piano player for the church. And it's Little Flower Baptist Church. Where is that at? It's, uh, well, where it was. It was on 130 in New York, 133rd Street and 8th Avenue. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. 133rd, 8th Avenue. And then you were like a 10-year-old piano player. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, I just kept playing and kept playing. And we moved from that church to another church called Universal, Universal Temple. Mm-hmm. And then that was like the big leagues because the drummer was the drummer for um, Africa Band Bada, Jazzy J. Mm-hmm. Um, DJ De- Jazzy J. He was the drummer of the church. And the actual, we had a DJ who DJ for the church when we went to uh, uh, like picnics and different things like that. He was the DJ for the church. who's a famous DJ today, DJ Red Alert. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we kind of grew up together, you know, Red Alert was like, you know, big brother to me and Jazzy J as well. And I didn't know what they were doing and they didn't know what I was doing as far as music is concerned. But I knew that we met on, at church and we would just jam and Jazzy J was rocking the drums. He was an amazing drum player, drummer. And, um, and I was playing uh, piano because the actual organ player was a, uh, it's like the uh, the minister of, of uh, music, Andre was his name. And then when Andre, I think he, he left or he quit and they had another organ player, but the pastor, Brevin Cofield, was an organist. So when Andre didn't play, Brevin Cofield would play. Mm-hmm. And he played, he played and preached. And I was there on the side, just, you know, following him. And he was, to me, a great teacher of uh, piano and organ. Mm-hmm. He was just amazing. And he had a voice like, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this artist. His name is Sylvester. Mm-hmm. So had one of them high voices, you know, it was like, like Maxwell, but in church. <laughs> and, um, I was just so fascinated by his talent. He was like a genius. He reminded me of Prince. Mm -hmm. He knew how to play every instrument and uh, really articulated and taught us well in church. And so we uh, found out some things that was not, you know, kosher to us as uh, members of the church. And Mm -hmm. we just kind of 
I kind of fell off from the church because I didn't believe anymore, you know, with seeing what he did with the mm. church members. And, yeah. You know, that's another story. But that was, you know, for me, inspiring, learning from the experience. And then um, I kind of moved on to wanting to find someone to join, a band to join. Mm -hmm. But there was a basement across the street from my projects where I grew up. And there were there was two bands playing, actually one band, and then it turned into two bands. And uh, I used to always try to go over and audition for them. And they wouldn't let me audition until I finally just said, OK, I'm going to take my Casio. I used to, my mom bought me a Casio and mm -hmm. I used to walk around and play with it. And I said, I'm going to take my Casio and just start playing on the stoop so they can hear me. And they wasn't even paying attention to me. <laughs> so I kind of, you know, basically I went to get attention and I asked one of the guys, his name was Jerome. He was the guitar player. Because he was sitting outside and that I, I don't know if he was smoking a cigarette, I can't remember, but he came outside for air and I said, excuse me, mister, would it be possible if you guys would let me show you how I can play piano? Because y'all don't have a piano player, y'all don't have a keyboard player. Mm -hmm. He's like, how do you know, Shirley? I said, I've been, I live across the street. And I hear y'all playing, and y'all sound amazing. And I just want to know if I can be the keyboard player. It's like, Shady, you're too young. How old were you? I was 13, 14, 14. And how, and they're, how old are they, like in their 20s? They were or? like 19, 20, 21. Okay. <laughs> you know? So I was like, uh, I was like, they're not going to let me play. So one day, it should, I asked them and I asked again and I kept going back every day. Finally, it said, Shirley, we're going to let you play. I said, bet. I thought I was going to play my Casio. Why did I think that? Uh -huh. They said, Shirley, give us the Casio. Because if you don't know how to play, you're taking your Casio. So, oh, God. So what am I going to play? They said, you're going to play this piano right here, this keyboard right here. And it was actually a Fender Rhodes. Uh, 60, no, 70, 73 keys. Um, and it was hard, like a real piano. It's like, mm -hmm. but this is harder. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to have to do it. Play a chord with two two hands mm -hmm. because the Casio, you don't need to stretch, <laughs> but a piano, you got to stretch. Yeah. And I made it work. The first song that they played was um, Reasons by Earth, Wind and Fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily I knew the song because my ear was like, okay, you know how to play that. So first thing I asked is what key y'all played in? Say the original key. I said, okay. I didn't say E flat. They didn't say E flat. We just started playing. Mm -hmm. Okay, Shirley, here's your chance. One, two, three, four, two, dun, dun. So I'm doing the, all the different parts with two hands. Da, 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 <laughs> so the guys were looking at each other like and they were impressed so I said let me look down and not look at them and so I don't mess up and I kept going kept going the next thing you know I said okay I'm going to play another song I don't know if you know it Shirley but so far you're doing good <laughs> so I said, okay, what's the next song? So I think they played Searching by the group Change. It's an old song. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, man, 
I happen to know that song too. So we we play that song, and then we play "Never Too Much" by the same by Change, but everything is sung by Luther Vandross. And uh, they welcome me into the band. Yeah. Like, Shirley, can can you come on this day, this day? This is when we play. I did not know that some of the guys were, you know, drug dealers. Yeah. <laughs> but I learned as I, as I, you know, been going down there and I kept my mouth shut. So anything that went on, I just kind of, walked away from it. And one day I walked into one of their other spots and they were like, show you, you got to stay out of here. Mm-hmm. That's where the dealings was being done. And I said, okay, no problem. And I just kept going to the music center and, you know, playing with them when they had time to play. And then there's a new song to learn. I would learn it with the guitar player who became my guardian. His name mm-hmm. is Jerome Dickens. So was this one of the drug dealers or is this not? One well, of- he was a drug dealer. He was the hardworking man. He was a clean guy. Mm-hmm. You know, he was, he was the guy that was, you know, he kept, every, he kept everybody straight, even though the actual head of the band was, was the drug dealer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, but he was an inspired guitar player. And Jerome also taught him, you know, some of the stuff that he knew Jerome would teach him, you know, this is how you would play that because he always wanted to just join the band when he didn't, you know, we had the time off to do that. Um, why, why did you move in with Jerome? I didn't move in with him. I just, I just went to the actual music center every day okay. to learn from him the songs so that gotcha. I would know all the songs that the band played. So if we had a gig, the people you were ready so um what was it like growing up uh you know around drug dealers and that kind of environment like were you aware of it were you scared of it what was that i was definitely aware of it and i was never scared of it because that's where i'm from you know it's like when you're from the hood you know you you know what goes on in the hood so Mm -hmm. it's like you you can't be afraid of that especially if you have to live with uh, so as I started to get deeper into the music industry, first of all, my block, my projects, you know, all we all looked together, we all were friends, we all went to elementary, junior, and high school, most of my friends. And then at some point, I kind of broke off from them because they wanted to, you know, stick around the block and play stickball. And, you know, basketball in the park. And I'm like, how could I, you know, get out of here? You know, if I'm going to be a basketball player, I want to play with the center. So I joined the center. I wanted to do what everybody was doing as far as curriculum Mm -hmm. was concerned because I was always in doing my homework after school, doing everything I need to do so that I can get out to play. But my playtime, I kind of devoted towards doing music with the band as much as I can. Mm-hmm. And if I play basketball, it would be with the center. If I play baseball, it would be with the projects. You know, everybody would get a team because it was enough guys to make two teams of, you know, six to eight guys. You know, so that's it. Yeah, awesome. So um, when did you think, hey, this, this is what I'm going to do for a living, music? Um. I thought about that at 15, 16. Okay. So it wasn't hard. Everything happened year after year. I was doing something new. I competed in a talent show with two bands. I was in two bands. And it was a younger band that I uh, joined with uh, Timmy Gatlin, who's the original member of God. And we put together this band and sort of like the Jacksons or a new edition. Mm-hmm. And uh, at some point we made a record, but it didn't go too far. 
So these are the things that I pretty much did when I, while people were, you know, at some point I tried the street thing, but mm-hmm. I got in trouble. When I got in trouble, found my mom picking me up from the from the precinct. And uh, after a while, I didn't never do it again. I just turned the music and never turned back. Mm-hmm. Who were some of your early uh, mentors that helped you to, you know, find your groove in music? Um, well, first, it would be Jerome. Mm-hmm. Second, it would be Royal Bayan. Royal Bayan, he's the cousin of Cool in the Gang. Okay. So I, I used to go to the studio to see Cool in the Gang record at 14, 15. Yeah. And was that kind of Cool in the Gang? Was that when they were at their peak? Yes. Okay. So that was a big deal. Celebration, ladies' night. That was a big deal. It's actually all of the stuff that I'm giving you pieces of is actually in my film. Mm-hmm. The development. So, yeah, it's. Uh, that was uh, the most incredible experience because I I didn't only meet Kuhn and Gang. I met Entume, who was an amazing producer, and a lot of people sample his songs, like Biggie. Biggie's first song, the Juicy record, is yeah, yeah. Entume. And then I met Kashif, who made Saving All My Love For You, with Houston. Mm-hmm. And we were actually in the same building you know, at some point, you know, he would have me come and sit in a session. And I can only remember him working on just songs for Freddie Jackson and Melba Moore. So these were experiences that made me want to just do music only. Mm-hmm. So, and what, what was your first big break? Like what helped you to like get on the scene, so to speak? Well, to me, my first big break was uh, doing my first R&B record with Pete Sweat. I won. Mm-hmm. So you like produced that with him or for yes. him? Mm-hmm. I produced the music. Mm-hmm. And I wrote the hook. So usually when I'm writing songs, I write the hook and let the lyrics is write the lyrics. Sometimes I'll come up with some of the words, but I'll mainly come up with the melody. Okay. Awesome. And then, um, so Keith Sweat, what was it like to work with him? Working with Keith Sweat, uh, working with Keith Sweat was like working with, uh, Someone who was a mentor at that time, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I admired his uh, savviness because he was a he was a broker on Wall Street. Mm, really? Oh, yeah, he was a broker on Wall Street, and learning from him how he became fly, you know, and uh, you know, everybody, the youngsters always look at the guy that's fly. You know, that mm-hmm. dress nice, wear suits, you know, people who we consider like mentors and, you know, who we want to be like. So I always admired how, you know, he dressed so cool, but he wasn't a hustler. Mm-hmm. He was actually a, a broker and made a lot of money. And uh, he used to be in the other band that we competed against and we actually beat in the talent show. So he always remembered me from that. And somebody told him, you know, that little kid that was in the talent show that, you know, you guys, he won with his band against Jamila, which was his band. Mm -hmm. So that kid is making music right now. He's making all the rap records for everybody. So I did Dougie Fresh. I did Kumo D. I did Big Daddy King. I did LL Cool J, Spoonie G, B-Fats. Who else? Uh, Classic to Lex and Effect, Lump Shaper. So I already got my experience from that. And I don't call that my big break because a lot of records they would just play only in New York. Uh-huh. Not a big break for me. What was the big break was Pete Sweat, my first RB record, I wanna. 
and make it last forever that um, went worldwide. You so, know, so the other stuff that you had done to that point, was that mostly rap? Yes. And then that rap at that time wasn't going big. It was just local. And yeah, then, one of them, W. Fester's show went big, but it took a while for it to surface outside of New York. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a record that came out of the box and surfaced through the whole continent. Of yeah. America. It was Key Sweat. And then as a producer, I mean, a lot of times, I, I would say the producers, the people kind of a little bit behind the scenes, they don't get a lot of the credit. Like people don't realize, you know, like, hey, that is really Teddy who, you know, wrote that song, you know, like, um, how, how do you leverage it? How do you get to be, you know, have more success? I mean, do people in the industry know better? Do they say, hey, that's the guy you want to work with at that point? Yeah, they did. I mean, it took a little while, but it took me just being consistent. Mm -hmm. I was so consistent. I made so many records. And before 25, I was over 100 records. So how old were you when you did Keith Sweats? I was 19. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's pretty crazy. Um, then uh, tell me what New Jack Swing is. New Jack Swing is a genre, a music genre, but it's also a movement. Mm -hmm. You look up New Jack Swing, you'll see over 150,000 sites and information on New Jack Swing, which was originated by me. But a lot of people did New Jack Swing. You know, when you say but, originated by you, you're like, you're like, hey, I am the guy that invented New Jack Swing. No, I'm not saying I'm the guy that invented the name, but I invented the music. Okay. The name was given to me and it was called New Jack Swing by a mentor of mine, Barry Michael Cooper, who then was mentoring me as far as media mm -hmm. training. So teaching me how to speak to media and speak to people, you know, as I was being developed as an artist. So he's the guy that kept asking me, so what are you going to name this music? And I wasn't getting it until five, six, seven years later, New Jack Swing mm -hmm. is the sound of Teddy Riley. And then they were saying Babyface and L.A. and, and uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis because, you know, they worked on uh, Janet Jackson. And that's when it started blossoming because the groups I was working with, Guy, Keith Sweat was really big, but not as big as Janet. Mm -hmm. So I thank them for helping me spread this genre and, and that uh, genre yeah. is kind of a fusion of r&b and fusion rap everything. okay r &B, rap pop jazz no diggity blues yeah all which explains just fusions of music yeah i think a lot of times people don't realize that you know you think of like rap is one thing and then r&b is another thing and it's kind of all come together where it's like, hey, you you blend that rap and blend that R and B and you'll have like, you know, trumpets or whatever, you know, jazz instruments in that music too. And it makes it like a fun, vibrant, like a different kind of energy, you know, than just like one thing. That's what... It is. And I'll tell you, when I was doing it, I didn't understand, but it was my imagination that pushed me to do it because I always wanted to see most of these artists get together, mm -hmm. duets, Michael Jackson and James Brown. Because I always thought that Michael Jackson style, some of it came from James Brown. And then mm -hmm. later on, I realized James Brown is his biggest idol. One of his biggest idols is James Brown. So I said, okay, now I understand. Michael kind of made it his own, but he kind of got it from 
you know, a lot of the dances that he admired, mm -hmm. including James Brown. So, yeah. And then um, how, how old were you when you worked with Michael Jackson? I was 20. Wow. It was a... 1991, so 91. Uh, I was uh, 30. Okay, I was eight. <laughs> yeah. How old are you now? I'm uh, I'm 38. So I was I was eight. eight. So, yeah, I'm. It's, I was 30. So 30. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, um, what what was it like working with Michael? College. I felt like. I graduated from high school, which was dealing with like the key sweats and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then going into Michael was like college, you know, because when you work with somebody that big, it's almost like being going to get your master's. Mm -hmm. So I'm 20 something songs deep with Michael. I have my master's. <laughs> so Michael, Michael is considered to me the university. Mm -hmm. What kind of things did you learn from uh, Michael Jackson University? All the different fundamentals of recording and dealing with people mm -hmm. and life. You know, such a humble guy. You know, he taught me. You know, I thought I was humble. This guy is the epitome of humble. It's, you can't. It's an understatement because he's so such a beautiful soul and he taught me how to to be that you know just by watching him. he didn't tell me what to do mm -hmm. he, just, he just did it you know and I kind of mimic myself after him you know when it comes to dealing with people and dealing with life so when you say he's like just the way he tr treated people like he was just really good to people like what was so yeah yeah all of that, he was, he, was, he was great with people and just don't piss him off. <laughs> he got, he had a temper on him a little bit. He, he can, he can get one. Yeah. Um, yes. mu musically, like, did you feel like you became a, a better musician after working with him or? Sure I have. I felt like I became a better producer, um, which incorporates all of it, you know, learning how to, do vocals with him, mm -hmm. learning him, period. You know, I never thought about studying an artist until after Michael. Because he, just even the thought of working with Michael, better be ready. Mm -hmm. You got you to gotta be ready. And, and if you're not, you'll be sent home like a lot of people have been sent home. So he's like, hey, you're not, you're not ready for me. See you later. No, you don't say that. Uh-huh. You just disappear. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say nothing. His people will go, you know, Michael, you know, this, you don't think this is going to work. And, you know, they figure out a way to get rid of you. Mm -hmm. I was, I was lucky. You know, I was blessed, not lucky, but blessed yeah. how to still be there and him, you know, acknowledging my talents mm -hmm. do you feel like you got to know him as like a a person like one-on-one -on -one? yes we when he built the studio for me he built a bed a bedroom for himself so i had my bedroom so he built a studio for you he built it was a studio already built it's larrabee studios larrabee okay. north and larrabee north was a studio, but when he got in there, it was a studio, game room, pool room, bedroom, and we had still had three studios. Mm -hmm. It was a studio that he he records in. It's a small room in the back, most next to his bedroom, which was like a sauna. Because he <laughs> loved heat. So when you're meeting with Michael, just bring a fan or something. Be it's like, gonna be hot. <laughs> it's gonna be hot. So, so yeah. Was that at his Neverland Ranch, or was that like a, a separate no, place? Or it was it was uh, in right down the street from Universal Studios. So I okay. stayed. Well, I stayed maybe ten times or 
no more than 20 times in the Hilton Universal. Mm -hmm. He put me in there, but I was more in the studio because he built a room in the studio. But he said, you may want to go to the hotel. I said, well, you're going to keep it. I was thinking wasting money. He's like, yeah. So that whenever you want to go in there, it's your room. It's like your home. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If you insist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was something that people don't know about him or, or something that you found kind of unique about him? He's very hmm, unpredictable. Mm -hmm. You don't know what he's going to do that day. I remember, just give you an idea, one day we were working on Remember the Time doing the vocals and we did the first verse and he was just so happy. And then he disappeared. I thought he was here. He said, I want to take a break, put on my voice, and uh, I'll come back and we'll finish the second verse. This guy disappeared and went to Switzerland. Switzerland? Yes. <laughs> okay. he Switzerland. He said, I have to take a trip to go approve the stores in his mall. So I was like, no, cool. I need to go home, you know, for a minute. Would it be okay? He said, no. So somebody told me no in a nice way, too. He's like, <laughs> please don't go. And I'm like, so I miss my family. He said, bring them. I said, bring them? He said, yeah. So I miss my friends, too. Bring them in a nice voice, you know, the Michael Jackson voice. Yeah. And then I said, well, what about us traveling and going places? Rent them cars. So Michael, I don't have the money for that. He said, then but call Norma and she will get it all done for you. I said, okay, you sure? He said, of course I'm sure. I want you to stay there. We have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. And if you can, you want to work with other artists? I said, no, I'm going to work on more music for you. He said, that's great. Then do it. You know, and when you have free time, go out with the family. You don't even have to work right now. I said, no, I want to work. He said, well, that's good. You know, I, I enjoy working with you. And he had to tell me that in order for me to you know, think about staying. Because yeah. And he said, everyone leaves me. And I said, what do you mean? He said, everyone leaves me. Dallas left me. And this person left me. You know, and I was just like, wow. He said, so you being there just gives me security. It's, you know. Mm hmm confirmation that we we belong together to do this record. This is you. And I said, me? He said, yeah. It's your style of music. And I enjoy it. And I want to do it. I want to own it. I said, wow. I said, okay. okay, so I'll, I'll call Noma. And <laughs> we'll get it going. <laughs> And I had my family, my daughter was just being born. Now she's 34 years old. Mm -hmm. That was 34 years ago. And so, and he was in Switzerland. Actually, no, 32 years ago, 30, 30, no, 31 years ago, because okay. she, was, she was three. And, so, uh, and you're just like, okay, I'll bring all my family and we'll just wait for you to get back and keep working. Yeah. But I was actually going to the studio as well, you know. Uh -huh. Like when he wasn't there, and I would just work on more music. And I came up with uh, She Drives Me Wild, and I Can't Let Her Get Away. And I just kept making beats. And even though he took a lot of the beats that I did, you know, so that's it. It's like going to college, you know. I passed my midterms and and got to mastering, that means I graduated <laughs> with seven songs. Yeah, so what did you do when you graduated? 
didn't do nothing. I didn't really celebrate nothing. Just came back to uh, New York. Moved to, no, actually, I came back to Virginia because my people and my family, everybody was moving me to Virginia. So I had already bought the places and then they were supposed to do the studio, wound up having to do the studio over because they made it look like a classroom music room, you know, like with the, yeah. the insulation, you know, that you can lift up the ceilings. Yeah. I'm like, it's not the way you build a studio. Now I'm just leaving Larrabee. I'm like, I went back so disappointed because I had to go back to work with Michael. And when I was disappointed, the owner of Larrabee is like, was like, you know, we can help you get your studio right. So I said, okay, can you guys do it in a certain amount of time? Because I'm, I don't know if Michael wants me to go back to work at my home or stay here. And nine times out of 10, he was just like, I need you to mix this back at home. Mm-hmm. And that was the time. Because he enjoyed the sound that I got out of the SSL board. And it was a different board, SSL board in uh, Larrabee. So I wound up going back home for a minute to mix that and also record and do the music for Dangerous. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so that was 91 when did uh no diggity come out no diggity was uh 95 96 okay and then who all is on that song like what other uh it's uh chauncey hannibal uh eric williams and mark middleton and myself mm-hmm isn't uh, Dr. Dre in that song? No, well, yeah, as far as the group is concerned, but as far as the guests yeah. appearances, it's uh, Dr. Dre and Queen Pen. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And then uh, what was the creative, like, I guess, is that the song that you're most proud of? Or is that just the song that's most popular? It's the song that's most popular with me as a singer. Yeah. The song is most popular from, with me as a producer is Michael Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. And which one do you like? I mean, is there one that you're like more fond of? Are you like more proud of the work with Michael? Or are you more proud of the work with you as a singer? Soon another time. That's what it, that was the best, the top on my list. Uh huh. And then no thing. So when I was in, oh gosh, it was like seventh, I think it was seventh grade, eighth grade. I remember it coming out and I just remember everybody being so pumped about that song. It was like the coolest song in the world. And I was like, just loved it. And even now when I hear it, I just am like, I am immediately energized and like ready to dance. I want to like uh, get going. I have a vibe, a okay. feeling, you know? Oh, wow. I, I, I get that from everyone, you know, they are. Uh... They love the record. Still today, you know, it's Instacart. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know? uh, so I'm proud of that, you know, that I'm able to be a part of something that was so successful. It's, it's, it's almost 20 years. This record is still going. So that's like, uh, that's no, that's uh, 27 years. That's almost 30 years, right? Yeah. Almost 30. Did I say 30 years 20, or 20? You said 20, yeah. No, uh-huh. no, yeah, almost 30 years. It came out 95, yeah. Yeah. So what was it like working with Dr. Dre? And like, and how is that going? Are you like in the studio together? Or is he in his studio and you're in your studio and you're just talking? Like, how does that go? It's so crazy. Dr. Dre was speaking to Jimmy Iovine and said to Jimmy Iovine, tell Teddy when he does this song, and he put this out, I want to be in the video. Uh-huh. And I said, you be in this video, you got to give me 16 bars. <laughs> right away, he said, say no more. He recorded it that night. Really? So he wasn't going to be in the song originally, but he wanted to be in the video. Unless he gave me 16. <laughs> and he gave me the 16. 
I was so like, because it was hard to get a death row artist. I was trying to get Snoop one time and they wanted, Suge wanted 50,000. I was like, get that from me. <laughs> and, <Yeah. laughs> and I'm not going to let Jimmy pay it because I'm not going to recoup that. So we never got Snoop and we got Dre when Dre was leaving, leaving uh, uh, Shook. When he left Shook, that's when we got him. Yeah. That's awesome. And that's it. So you told me a story about uh, you hanging out with Michael Jordan. Um, do, you want, do you want to tell us about the first NBA game you went to? Yeah. Actually, it was a birthday present for my, my little brother, Markel, from Rex and Effect. And I wanted to surprise him. We had a show in Chicago and I invited him to the show, of course, to perform with me on the stage. But after the show, I took him to a Bulls game and I had it all set up for his birthday. Mm -hmm. And uh, he thought that was it. He thought, you know, seeing the game, we can go to our hotel room. I was like, nah, follow me. And they escorted us back to the back. And uh, we got to the back of the, the, in the dressing room and everybody recognized us from the Bulls. And I was just amazed by that. But Michael Jordan, you know, himself came over to us, we took pictures and, and uh, I got to introduce him and myself to my brother. Yeah. So, yeah. And then... Uh... And afterwards, he actually requested Black Street to model his shoe. And we did it. We actually modeled the, the shoe with the light blue patent leather. Mm -hmm. That was out back in 1994, 95. Yeah, I think the shoe, shoe that you're talking about is the, uh, the 11s, right? Yeah. The Jordan 11. Yeah. I, I, the first time I hung out with Teddy, I was wearing a pair of Jordan 11s and he's like, oh, that shoe? I, I modeled those. <laughs> yeah, but it was years ago. Now they're back new again. It just, yeah, he, was, he brought it back out. Yeah. So it's amazing it's, uh, how we were, you know, a part of launching that shoe. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then tell me, I guess you're friends with Flava Flav. Is that right? Yes. One of my best friends. So are you, um, you were telling me a little bit about teaching his son to play music. Is that right? Yeah, actually just setting his son up with the, his starter kit because when he, when he came to me, he had stuff that was just so complicated for him. So I said, you know, I started pulling out some stuff from my closet that I know he would enjoy, that, you know, a kid would enjoy. And it's a drum machine and keyboard and stuff to go with the drum machine and he was just so happy. So I'm, I'm hoping that he's continuing being consistent, you know. That's, you know, for me, it was very special because it was almost like someone had did that for me when I was young. Yeah. Now it's my chance to do it for, for more people. So, yeah. So, you know, we talked a little bit about some of your mentors, Jerome. You know, I feel like Michael Jackson probably was in some way a mentor. You know, Keith Sweat had some moments there. Like, are there, are there some other people that were pretty impactful in your kind of career and your music development or? Yes. Um, Jimmy Iovine uh -huh. was definitely an impact in my life. And I've learned so much from him as well. We were partners uh, on the Black Street Project and Queen Pen. And it was amazing, like just doing business and, and being his partner at the same time and being his friend. Mm -hmm. still today so I um, I cherish those moments and, and Andre Hillel who passed away after my verses so you know I just know that um, you know I have a lot of friends out there I don't get to see them much and most of them are really a, an impact of my, in my career mm-hmm who are some of the people that you feel like you're able to uh, mentor and help out with and kind of teach in their um, music career? Well, first would be uh, Pharrell. Pharrell. That's a big name. Yeah, I signed Pharrell first and I chose him out of a, 
a talent show, him and his crew, the nerds. Really? Yeah, Neptunes. And uh, yeah, I um, discovered him and Lightning Jerkins. And uh, just a few of them, you know, Black Street Queen Pin, a lot of artists. Have but you worked with uh, Usher before? Yes, I have. I worked with Usher. We've done a couple songs, and that was a while ago. Yeah. Um, and did you ever work with Prince? You had mentioned him earlier in the podcast. but Yes, I did. I, I did a love sign for Prince. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was experience as well. So, in terms of, like, musicians, I mean, Michael Jackson's super talented. Prince is super talented. Like, I mean, is there one that you felt like was like a better musician or, or what were your kind of thought, thoughts about them kind of compare and contrast um, a little? Say that one more time. Yeah, I so, just, um, how would you compare Michael Jackson and Prince as musicians? They're both geniuses. Uh-huh. And they both were best friends. They were best friends with each other? Yes. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. They were best friends at one point, and they used to hang out with each other like kids. And I felt like the media and so many other things and people and components had broke them up. Really? Yes, yeah, same thing like Biggie and Tupac. When you say the media kind of broke them up, I mean, is it like kind of planting stories about them or... Mm-hmm. And yep. then, like, word gets to one about the other, and then they get mad about things. Is that uh, something like that? They were supposed to do "I'm Bad," the Bad record together. Okay. I who looked like Prince was supposed to be Prince. Uh huh. But he wound up not doing it because he didn't like the lyrics, the lyrical content. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Your butt is mine. <laughs> so it's like almost like it's a fight. But it's, you know, it was just a movie that they were supposed to do in this, a short film. Mm-hmm. Ad was supposed to be. But it didn't turn out that way. And I don't know the intricate part of the story, but I know that it was over a little content. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. So who are some people that you have not worked in your career, but that you would like to work with? It would be... New edition, which is, you know, I'm putting together things for them now. And and uh, we had our first meeting and they uh, they like the music. You know, I was just, mm-hmm. I'm just waiting to see what's going to be the next step. And, and we're going to take it from there. Yeah, but I'd definitely love to work with them. It's their 40th anniversary coming up. And it would be amazing to be a part of it. Um, and then in terms of your whole life, like outside of music, like what are the things you're most proud of about your accomplishments? Um, winning all my awards and my children are there to support me. Yeah. And being able to give my mom her flowers when I win any of my awards and my athletes. So that's what I'm most proud of. And being able to spend some time with my kids, you know, my children. Mm-hmm. Uh, I took some time off doing music and just took the time to, to be with them. But I got sick at the same time, discovering that I have uh, hyperthyroidism. Okay. And it kind of changed my life. And I just, I was only supposed to be off for two years. I wanted to be in off music for like four to five years. Just staying at home with the family and enjoying them. How did that time change you? It changed me. Well, it just gave me more um, inspiration. Mm-hmm. And make, when you ain't do something for a while, you want to get back to it. Or you'll give it up. Mm-hmm. So I didn't give it up. I went back to it and just did it. And then Throughout your whole life, like what have been the things that have helped you be the happiest, like or brought you the most happiness in your life? Hmm. The most happiest is music. Yeah. <laughs> it's music. 
and my children, you know, just being around my kids and my mother. Yeah, there's something about music that just kind of is like a fun, energetic vibe, but also I think creation, you know, like you're like, I, when I listen to music, I'm just listening to music. But when you're doing music, you're creating, you're building, you know, and anytime we're like creating music, things, yeah, I think that is like a, a happy time, you know, when you're like making something, you know, oh, when you create, so it's like creating a baby being born. Yeah. You're starting from scratch. And it's like, but it doesn't take nine months. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you know, sometimes it's less, no time, or sometimes it's, it could be a month. I remember spending a month on one song with Michael. Mm -hmm. It's a perfectionist. So. And then the other thing you talked about too, is like, like actually like your kids are one of your greatest source of happiness. And I think that's interesting too. Cause it's also on that creation front, you know, it's like something that you made and like, you know, helping other people develop. It's like a, just an act of love, you know? And I think those service okay. things that we do, like that's where we find some of our most happiness. So um, you mentioned that film that you had, that you're working on, like, where is that at in the progress? Like, is that something that's going to be uh, coming out soon or? Actually, we're looking at next year. We're still developing and figuring out where we're going to go with it. But uh, yeah, we're looking at next year. And then uh, who, who would you have play? Is this like a documentary or is this like a feature or? It's a biography about my life. Okay. Like a biopic? Yeah, sort of. But it's uh, unlimited because you can't put 40 years of, of uh, I say, great film in two hours. Yeah, totally. You know, people want to know what truly went on the lives of the new Jack Swing artists and myself. Mm -hmm. so, I don't want to cut you. No, we're I, good. I have, I have my six o'clock. Um, that's well, why I said we're going to do it four times. No, that's so perfect. Well, thanks time. for all the time. Thanks for all the time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we look forward to seeing we that could, film come out. And... We can definitely do this again. Um, I just want to say that I truly enjoy my pillows and um, I can't wait to get back there so that you can see it in the flesh, you know, when you come back to Vegas, you know, um, by yeah. your best house. Hey, uh, snap me a picture of you on your pillow cube, man. I'd love to hang it in the wall here at the office and show people, you know. Hey, this you is Teddy, inventor of New Jack Swing. Um, but Let's hey, it. it's uh, great being your friend, man. Thanks for coming on and telling us about all the... You've had a pretty awesome life and uh, I'm glad we could kind of share it a little bit with people. So thanks so much, man. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And tell okay. the rest of the crew that I say hello. I'll do it. Okay. All right. Awesome. We'll see you. Peace and love. Yep. Bye. Bye.